head start for you. But now we're going to have our speaker for tonight, our very own John Matthews. And he is going to take us on a quite an expedition up through the Columbia River Gorge to Glacier National Park to land at a guest ranch in the southeast corner of British Columbia, along with his birding buddy and photographer friend, Audubon member Vic Brockett, a retired science teacher. Um, John retired from careers in oceanography and recycling and has been doing bird photography for over 30 years himself. So the two of them have a lot of experience and are both superb photographers. And John, the, the goal of their big trip was to head up to a particular school on how to shoot with a camera hummingbirds, not with a gun, not with a slingshot, but with a camera. And so John is going to be telling us all about it, giving you some tips. But uh, while you're listening to him, don't forget that we'll have a question period and we hope you will put your questions in chat as they occur to you so that you don't forget the questions and then G Judy can get answers from John. But now John, take us on a trip. Well, thank you, Eugenia and welcome everybody. It's, wow, I see 53 folks here, <laughs> like a little stage fright here, but thank you very much to Salem Audubon Birders Night Committee and you know, Eugenia and Kathy Patterson, Judy Bronco, and of course, Tim Johnson for all of his technical expertise, which I hope I can use here in a few minutes. I particularly want to share, uh, give my thanks to a lot of the folks that helped make this possible for me. Uh, in particular, my buddy, Vic Brockett, who helped shed light on some of these memories that we shared over 10 years ago. And thank you, Vic, for some of your photos for this presentation and uh, your memories. Uh, and a very special thanks I'd like to give to my daughter, Stacy DFC Matthews, for creating all the PowerPoint maps that we'll have here. But most importantly, and very especially, my fiance, Panina Alba Tesali. That it kind of looks like me at the bottom of your screen, but no, it's, it's, she's different. <laughs> but I want to thank you for her extraordinary support, astute suggestions, and patience as I burrowed through over 3,000 slides to recreate tonight's program from scratch. I lost the original one. Uh, let's see, recording, uh, a recording of this presentation will be made on the Audubon um, website. You can get uh, their YouTube channel. So let's see, um, oh, and we'll also have some um, uh, addresses for the folks that put on the photo workshop uh, um, Gerlach Nature Photos and John Gerlach, uh, they'll be ready on the website. So now I think um, if Tim can help me get the screen here. Oops. I don't think you need my help, John. You got it. Okay. <laughs> Yay. Okay. Um, well, I changed the title of the program. I just thought shooting hummingbirds was uh, not quite the right idea. So I got a wondrous sojourn while seeking the hummingbirds of Bull River. I thought it might be a little bit better title than the other one to advertise. At any rate, I want to share this birding photography trip that I went on with my good friend and fellow bird photographer, Vic Brockett. The workshop was about photographing the hummingbirds of British Columbia presented by John Gerlach of Gerlach Nature Photos. I'm going to divide this <clears throat> uh, adventure program into three sections. Uh, the first is the trip, to, uh, um, the trip to the workshop in Bull River, British Columbia, featuring the scenery and birds and creatures all along the way. Then I'll talk about the workshop itself, featuring the three species of hummingbirds signed up as our models. 
And a couple of comments on photography if you want. And thirdly, a lovely return trip through British Columbia, uh, the Idaho Panhandle and the pothole plains of Washington. Let's see. Okay, we'll get this figured out here. We left Salem on an early Friday morning, May 13th, 2011, and returned a week from the following Sunday of May 22nd. <laughs> okay, uh, the trip of probably something over 1,542 miles, according to Stacy's map, but even at speed limits, um, I can't imagine doing it in 28 hours. For sure, you'd miss 99% of the birds and all the scenery. Our first picture stop that we made was at the Tom, the Tom McCall Nature Preserve on the old Columbia Gorge Highway between Hood River and the Downs. Here, our first impact of color was the wildflowers galore. I think the first slide on your left is a balsam root, sun, uh, balsam root, excuse me, arrow leaf balsam root, which is part of the sunflower family. And Tim told me how to find out the name of the this middle flower, but I didn't take an opportunity to get it figured out. So if you can help me uh, identify this middle white flower that we have. And of course we have the, the beautiful lupin, I guess is a, some kind of a prairie lupin. This is all starting to make up, which is going to be a growing palette of colors along our way. Part of the color, of course, is in the birds as witnessed by this Western tanager and uh, uh, Oregon white oak. And this bird, perhaps not as colorful, but a beauty in its own way. I'm thinking, given its uh, color, distinct vest, wing bars, and primary projection of its wings, uh, this possibly a western wood peewee, although I'd welcome any more learned opinions uh, uh, that you can put in the chat, let me know. Here we have the arrow leaf, arrow leaf balsam root, as well as the lupin as we're overlooking the Columbia Gorge. Also overlooking the gorge was a turkey vulture making a swing towards us, and really towards us, uh, maneuvering over the gorge cliffs coming right at us and looking eye to eye. This is quite a view of a turkey vulture. I don't think I was more than uh, 10, 15 yards away when I took this shot. Yep, right up close eye to eye. Great close up of the beautiful bird. And on we go. There goes the turkey vulture and we're about ready to take off too. The next photo sh stop was off the highway as we approached a wetland near Boardman. Here we glimpsed a great egret moseying along through the stubble. And over on the overhead guy wire, our first Western Kingbird checking out the scenery. Then we were off to Whitefish on our first overnight stop. Uh, you see Whitefish up in the near the upper right uh, corner of your screen there past pa Kalispell. Um, but on our way uh, near Lewiston, we almost ran off the road when we spotted a family of great horned owls. Mom and her two chicks checking us out. They were quite a sight. Gladly, there wasn't much traffic on the highway at this time. And on towards Kalispell, on a hill studded with wildflowers, we saw our first mountain goats. Coming down to Kalispell, we got our first glimpse of the, rock, of the Montana Rockies. Very moving landscapes for us while I'm at Valleyites. We buzzed through Kalispell and got our overnight room in Whitefish in time for dinner. And the next Saturday morning, we took off to Lake McDonald. The snow-covered Rocky Mountains of Glacier National Park was quite a spectacular backdrop to the freezing lake of Lake McDonald. It's hard to imagine wanting to move on from such a beautiful scene. Here's Vic with his trusty Nikon shooting the lower McDonald Creek as it empties into the lake. 
And then Harlequin ducks. This was the first time I had seen Harlequin ducks in their mountain breeding habitat, almost a thousand miles away from where I usually observe them on the Oregon coast. For some of the not so fun facts, um, Harlequins, I think, I think we messed up. Okay, we we got it got miscoordinated here. Here we got the Harlequins coming up onto a log or a rock there. Uh, but a little fun fact is their name Harlequin comes from um, the name of a colorfully dressed character in Commedia dell'arte. Their Latin name, Historonicus Historonicus, comes from histrio or actor. Other names for this creature include circus duck or painted duck for its beautiful colors, and also sea mouse because of its very unduck like squeaks. Now, for some not so fun facts, unfortunately, Harlequins have declined since the late 19, 1800s. It's not clear what the primary causes are. As a coastal species, Harlequin ducks are susceptible to oil spills as well as polluted runoff. The bioaccumulation of heavy, heavy metals from oil production is an increasing concern for sea ducks in general. Other causes could be loss of habitat due to logging. So here's this interesting looking female duck. What do you suppose that is sticking out of its back? It's not debris, any guesses? Here we see a yellow tag on this male. The female, of course, had a radio antenna, obviously subjects to, of, to and of scientific study. Their lifestyle is pretty rough on their bodies. Many harlequin ducks endure broken bones from a lifetime of being tossed around in the rough water. Beyond the ducks, the snow still blocked the highway to, uh, excuse me, the snow still blocked the highway to the sun. So we turned around and went back to Whitefish for the night, and then up on up to Bull River, Canada, um, via various lakes and sites along the way. This bird, is my 2005 Prius. I don't know about the Burlington Northern locomotive in the background, but my hybrid has now migrated over 193,000 miles, mostly on bird seeking adventures, including the 1600 mile trip you see here. After the train went by, we get to this better scene of serenity. Looking in the opposite direction from the train, we see trumpeter swans. Also, along with American widgeons and other ducks. Like the lesser, like these lesser scalp, I'm calling these lesser scalp as opposed to greater scalp because the male I see has a coarser barring on the forward part of its back. And the male, the front of the head is not as steep as you might expect on a greater. So that was my call. Anybody disagrees can put it in the chat. Here we have um, a spotted, uh, oh, excuse me, here we have, we've also spotted this leaf sandpiper, <laughs> noting the yellow legs and the decurved bill that you can see in the reflection. So on the same patch was a Stellar's J, ID'd by my friends at the, in the steering committee here as a coastal variety because of its blue streaks on its crest, not white. Later, we were impressed with a Cassin's finch. And finally, British Columbia. And the foothills of the Canadian Rockies. And along Canada Highway 93, mountain goats up close, really close. And deer and bighorn sheep. Only mildly curious about us. Quite a magnificent beast. This is what the Bull River looks like as it goes down through its cavernous gorge. Now we've arrived 
at the secluded Bull River Guest Ranch, which lies in, which lies in a small valley amid the spectacular snow-covered co snow Canadian Rockies. Workshop began on a Sunday evening and ended the following week on action on the next Saturday. So we spent a week here. The leader of the workshop was right. Uh, John Gerlach said this was an amazing place to photograph hummingbirds, as you'll soon see why. Here's some photos of the guest ranch. So it was there for more than just our hummingbird photography. It had resident donkeys and ponies. And although our featured feathered targets at the ranch were hummers, I couldn't resist with the local guineas. Since, oh, what happened? Excuse me. <laughs> Hummingbirds are site specific. They fly the same migration pattern every year and return uh, year after year to the Bull River Guest Ranch in early May. They're, their time of arrival varies only by a day or two. And since this is a photographic odyssey, I thought I should show you some of the equipment. Although Vic's equipment is uh, Nikon, since he's a Nikon disciple, I compete, I try to compete anyway, with my Canon equipment. This was the lens, uh, this is a setup that I use um, all, for all my shots there except for scenery. Specifically, I have a 1 to 400 uh, zoom lens, an extension tube to help fill the frame of, of the hummingbirds, and uh, cameras of a 7D Mark II with a uh, battery pack on the bottom to let me stay out a little bit longer. This is what our flash station setup looks like. It includes flowers that you can see there. Uh, kind of in the middle, not the flower on in behind there, but the flower on the table that you see the person shooting at. It has a sugar water feeder with a tube mouth that's placed behind the flowers. It also has uh, two to three flash units in front of the subject and one or two behind. And if you squint really hard, they're um, to the right of the middle flash, um, between the two bars of the fence, you can see a couple of little spots there. There are the hummingbirds. Photographers. Photographers have three one and a half hour periods to, sh to shoot at this flash at these flash stations each day. We expected to shoot more than 4,000 images during the three daily sessions each. So, three hummingbirds, three species. First one I'll talk about is the adorable calliope, which makes up about 45% of the resident hummingbird population. Another 45% is made up by the crimson rufus, rounded out by the charming black chin hummingbird, about 10%. In May, the breeding season is happening and the hummers have on their striking breeding plumage. Talking about the calliope first, the calliope is the, first, is the smallest bird in the United States. Let's consider it by weight and size. A typical first class letter, for instance, weighs about an ounce. A chickadee weighs about three tenths of an ounce, but a calliope weighs less than one tenth of an ounce. This hummingbird's small size goes along with its light weight. The chickadee again is about five inches in length compared to a calliope hummingbird that's only three inches. Most other hummingbirds are three and a half to four inches long for comparison. This tiny hummingbird is the smallest long distance migrant in the world. A calliope travels about 5,000 miles each year in its big oval from their breeding grounds to their wintering grounds. They migrate north along the Pacific coast in spring but return to their wintering grounds in Mexico uh, via the inland route along the Rocky Mountains. The Calliope hummingbird is named after Calliope, the muse of eloquence and epic poetry, who inspired Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. 
When feeding or in flight, their heart beats 1,260 times every minute. At night or in cold weather, while at rest, the tiny body goes into what's called a state of torpor, where the heartbeat drops to about 50 beats a minute. Their breathing also becomes irregular and sometimes they don't breathe at all. Another interesting fact is that these hummingbirds have the largest relative heart size of all birds. Their heart represents a whopping 2.4% of their total weight. Although hummingbirds are the tiniest of all birds, hummers are fierce. They're territorial and fearless. They have been known to chase off birds as large as raptors like the red-tailed hawks during their breeding season. On the breeding grounds, the male calliope aggressively defends their territories. Males spend more than half their time perched on exposed branches of willows and alders with a good view of their territory, allowing them to quickly chase off any intruders. This is a picture of a female calliope. and the male. Notice the beautiful iridescence on his gorget. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. There's spectacular U-shaped drives. In their spectacular U-shaped dives, they dive up to 100 feet from up in the air down to near the ground and then rise up again to repeat the flight. During the dive, they make a sputtering buzz with their tail feathers and make a sharp high-pitched zinging call that they chirp. The males also perform a shuttle display in which they hover in front of the females with their gorgets flared and their wings pulsing to produce a hummingbird-like, a, hummingbird a bumblebee-like buzz. Now we're off in a blink of eye. Can you see it? On to the rufous. The rufous hummingbird has the longest migration route of any North American hummingbird. They're known to migrate over 3,900 miles one way. The rufous hummingbird also makes a clockwise circuit of Western North America each year. They move up the Pacific coast in late winter and spring, reaching Washington and British Columbia in May. As early as July, they may start south again, traveling down the chain of the Rocky Mountains but they are only hummingbirds that go as far north as Alaska to breed. In comparison, uh, talking about their long flight here, let's compare it with a 13 inch Arctic tern. Uh, its one way flight is 11,000 miles, but it occupies, that's equivalent to about 51 million body lengths of an Arctic tern. Whereas the rufous hummingbird travels 78 million body lengths. That's a lot of body lengths. <laughs> okay, moving on. Oh, here we are, the Red Baron. Uh, he's so named after the infamous World War I triplane ace, the Red Baron. Rufus Hummingbird is a common visitor to hummingbird feeders here. It's extremely territorial at all times of the year, attacking any visiting hummingbird, larger, including much larger species. They've even been known to chase away chipmunks from their nests. The rufous are the most aggressive of any of the hummingbird species, which serves them well on their long migrations, needing to get to the best nectar first to refuel for their very long journeys. Here's a male and female rufous. I'm not sure if this close encounter is an amorous kiss or more of a challenge. Just whose flower is this, they might say. Two females in this case, uh, dealt by the chin markings on the, on the one and uh, the green back with the uh, orange base to their tail feathers on the one uh, facing away from us. You might say, oops, quick reverse. Rufus hummingbird has an excellent memory. 
for location. No doubt helping it find flowers, not only from day to day, but even year to year at the hundreds of Pacific locations on their long sojourns. Hummingbirds can even remember, even after a very long migration, where their feeder was last year. So if you will be to you, if you move it, you'll have to look for it because he always goes to where it was first. As you look at these photos, note the wings. When hummingbirds hover, they do so by moving their wings in a figure eight pattern. Many of these photos will show the wings position at very po various points in this figure eight pattern. Rufus hummingbirds, most like other hummingbirds, beat their wings extremely fast to be able to hover in place. The wing beat frequency of a Rufus hummingbird has been recorded at 52 to 62 wing beats per second. To stop this action while uh, photography for photographing the bird, it's handy to have a quick flash duration of at least one five thousandth of a second or faster, which is controlled for photographers. This, this information is it's controlled by reducing the amount of power going to the flash. The oldest Rufus hummingbird was a female. Well, excuse me, the oldest recorded Rufus hummingbird was a female, at least eight years and 11 months old when she was caught and re-released during banding operations in British Columbia. Hummingbird's tongue is fascinating. They don't really suck nectar. They have a long bill and when drinking nectar, they don't open their bill. They extend their tongue and lick up the nectar at rates of 13 licks per second. The hummingbird tongue has two grooves that the nectar moves through via capillary action. Then the bird retracts, retracts the tongue and squeezes the nectar off the tongue by constricting the bill and then it is swallowed. In cold weather, hummers may eat three times their body weight in nectar on a single day. The outer half of the tongue is also fringed, has fringed edges which help the hummingbird catch small insects. They can survive without nectar if insects are plentiful. So, with another blink of an eye, we move on to the black-chinned hummingbirds. I've seen a lot of black-chinned hummingbirds in Eastern Oregon, but not really any in the Willamette Valley. So it's a real treat for me to see them here. They are a medium to long range migrant from Southern B BC to South Central Mexico. One moment, please. One moment, please. We're experiencing some de technical difficulties. Okay, I'd say, let me keep going here. They are a medium to long range migrant from Southern BC to South Central Mexico. Those in Bull River are the last to arrive. This year, only a few days before the workshop began. They are here, they're at the extreme limit, Northern limit of their breeding range. Their total breeding range in Canada represents just 1% of their total breeding range. I don't know for sure if the females had arrived yet, Although I tried to convince myself some of my photos were really those of black chin hummingbirds, but you'll have to decide. These birds are more timid than the others at the photography workshop. The northern edge of the migration, being at the northern edge of their migration, they're the last ones to get there. Most of the good feeding locations seem to be occupied by the early, earlier arriving species. The iridescent hummingbird feathers are the most specialized of all bird feathers. I think it's pretty cool when the, the light is refracted from what looks like their black neck feathers with an apparent purple iridescence. The iridescence comes from tiny platelets of air bubbles that are located in the top third of the iridescent feathers. Depending on the, the, the location in the feather depends on whether you sometimes see it, sometimes don't, uh, depending on the angle of the sun, or like them on their back, you see it all the time because they're flat. They're different conformations of those um, little tiny air bubbles to give the different types of um, 
iridescent properties. Hummingbirds see wavelengths that we cannot. The males display appealing wavelengths visible to their potential female partners. The male breeding territory is uh, only a quarter acre or less. They will also often do U-shaped dive displays, sometimes 20 to 25 foot high to impress the birds that they are courting. Black chin hummingbirds aren't so much drawn to red as they are to the colors of whatever recent nectar sources they were at. This we can guarantee is a female black chin hummingbird because our instructor, John Gerlach, took it and labeled it as so. If you look at all the books, yeah, it does kind of match up. So it's been challenging to find one to perfectly match that image uh, in my photographs. So we'll see what, what happens here. Okay, is this one a female? Maybe or maybe not. Anyway, uh, the lifespan of the oldest known black chin hummingbird was a female, at least 11 years and two months old when it was recaptured and re released during banding operations in Texas. Well, how about this one? The top of the head is grayish, even, evenly spotted on the throat, splotchy, dull patterning on the chest and body. Hmm, I wonder. How about this one? Is that a female? Well, identifying hummingbirds can be a challenging uh, occupation to say the least. Uh, Eugenia lent me a copy of Peterson's Field Guides on Hummingbirds of North America. And I found this quote, I love it. It's important to accept that not all hummingbirds can be positively identified. Thank you, Eugenia. <laughs> well, this of all my pouring hummingbird photos is my last, but it's one of my favorites, a calliope male and female rufus. When territorial disputes hum up, heat up, hummingbirds often engage in displays and chases and actual fights. The two birds hover facing each other, often an inch or two apart. Each hummer tries to get above the other to strike it down. This may result in the birds rising way up in the air together. Bodily contact with their wings, bills, and feet can, can occur. Fights can last a minute or more. Well, now it's time to hit the road again, so we're off. Back to the United States, uh, up the Kootenai Valley towards Cranbrook, British Columbia, and then down the Idaho Band the Idaho Panhandle to Bonner's Ferry. Spent overnight in northern Idaho and then on to the Spokane area before heading west towards Odessa and the potholes area of around the Columbia National Wildlife Refuge before heading home. We stopped at many small lakes along the way to check out the various feathers. The idea on this one might be up for debate, but my guess is that it's maybe a greater scalp as opposed to a lesser one by the flatter head shape and it's relatively long bill. What do you guys think? Here we encountered a pair of cinnamon teal. They were putting up, uh, putting on quite a commotion for a while. The colors are beautiful on these stucks. They're just beautiful to look at. I love the crimson and there on the wing, the wing colors a pretty dazzling show. Note the red eye, quite a spectacular turn of events there. But if we turn the other direction, there's another show going on behind us. On this perch was a bald eagle. Dick and I scrambled quickly to get our cameras ready to um, document this bird and watch for when he was going to take off. We Lot over who is taking pictures what so these are a collection of both of our cameras clicking away as fast as we could it took off off the thing down into the air that was quite a quite a show then we went on to the bass potholes landscape of central washington one of the our only uh, Swainson's hawk that we saw was this one on top of a 
Well, it wasn't, it was some kind of a, a post there, of course, but that's our only Swainson's hawk. Good to see. And here is another Eastern Kingbird. And of course, our Western Kingbird checking out the fields. And in fields, we have to find our meadowlarks. Beautiful, beautiful birds. Oregon's uh, state bird, of course, but not Washington's. As we approached another water hole, another water hole um, this guy greeted us with flutters. This yellow-headed blackbird was quite a, quite a guy. And then he croaked. <laughs> No, he didn't die. He just let her out his his screech, which is a beautiful bird, but quite a different voice. Here is a voice that was much more beautiful, uh, our red-winged blackbird. Another cinnamon teal was trekking along in the wetlands, along with the gadwalls. Love the reflections in this water with these gadwalls. And redheads, a duck that I don't often see, a real joy for me. Vic and I really enjoyed the horned larks as well. They're giving their rendition of songs as well. One of my favorites of the trip was a black-billed magpie. I really loved uh, the iridescent blue of the feathers as he was flying. This was a, a thrilling photograph for me. I'd really been trying to catch this, this picture for years and years and years. It's, um, it was a lot of fun. It's also good to find our only warbler. So here we are, Kingbird East meets Kingbird West as we turn home. Even the sky seemed to speak to us in the majestic colors of the birds that we saw on our sojourn. So this was our trip. So I turn it over to you folks. I hope you really enjoyed the presentation. I really, envoy, really enjoyed vi revisiting the photos and memories of this road trip with my buddy Vic Brockett. So I'll be happy to answer any questions through chat. And remember, this presentation is also going to be available in a few days uh, through the Civil Audubon website. Well, thank hey, you, thank John. You. Um, I'm going to see if I can uh, unmute everybody and allow people to. Um, okay, so I'm going to allow everybody to unmute themselves if they want to ask a question without having to try to figure out the chat box. And we do have a couple questions in the chat box that maybe I'll start with and then give others an opportunity to ask their questions through their mic if they wish. And the, the question is about Salmonella and what we have to say about the recent uh, press, uh, quite a bit of media about Salmonella diseases at our feeders. And I'll, I'll make the following comment. I don't think there's really a definitive uh, answer to that. I've looked at the Center for Disease Control and they did confirm that there's an unusually large number of salmonella among birds this year. Um, and it's primarily affecting our pine siskins and our goldfinches. And the problem this year is we have an eruption of pine siskins. So that is partly responsible for the spread of this disease um, more widely than it would normally be. So what do we do about it? Well, my goodness, every source you look at has a different theory about that. And I don't think there is a definitive solution. Clearly, if you see a bird at your feeders who is obviously diseased and the signs are pretty clear, they're, they're lethargic, uh, they're not afraid of us. Uh, that if you see that situation, uh, if you see that situation, I would I would take down your feeders and and be careful because the salmonella can be spread to you as well. So the Center for Disease Control recommends that you put on rubber gloves 
and that you clean your feeders thoroughly. Uh, should you take down your feeders anyway? Uh, some people say you should. Um, I know how much the birds rely on these, this food this time of year, and it's really hard for me to do that unless I see my birds have disease. And so um, I, I can't recommend taking down your feeders just as a matter of, of rote. I, I would recommend that you just watch them, keep them clean, my goodness. Salmonella is not the only problem with spreading diseases this time of year with the seed getting wet with everything getting wet, it's just uh, ripe for other diseases as well as for mold. And the key, if you're gonna keep those feeders up is keep them clean, make sure that seed is dry. And if you can't keep it clean and dry, take them down. Uh, so I think that's, that's all I have to say about that. There was a comment, John, I don't know if you wanna comment about this. We had the same comment last month. People are starting to discover and I think they've always been there, but uh, maybe the populations are growing of uh, acorn woodpeckers at Bush Park. Um, I've been seeing them over the years. Um, I go to Bush Park fairly often. At the top of that roller derby ramp, there's a nice grove of oaks and I have seen acorn woodpeckers up there. And so uh, we didn't have any questions per se about your talk, John. I will, I will ask you about Boy, the field of view on your, you just nailed the focus on, on, on a variety of challenging field of view shots there, I would think. How did you control that focus and your field of view when you're taking those photos, if I may ask? Well, um, depending on if, it, if they're in the studio and they were flash generated, uh, I used a, a small f-stop um, like an f-22 or so to give a, a good depth of field uh, for the flash of, for a small bird like the hummingbird. When we were out uh, around the area looking in the bushes and, and shooting in natural light um, would take more traditional uh, things and we, I had a much shorter um, uh, depth of field and uh, but I was often further away from the birds so um, sometimes they weren't as much as in focus. Some of those photos that I showed um, were uh, had a, I used a F5.6 because of the amount of light and that I needed to use a very fast shutter speed. When I was shooting with flash, uh, my shutter speed had to be that that's synchronized with the flash, which was about one 250th of a second. And of course, if you didn't use a flash, that would just show a very uh, blurry feathers there. So, um, I don't know if that answers your, your question. Uh, yeah, thank you. We have a question uh, from Dominic. Did you have the opportunity to observe hummingbirds building nests or with, uh, with young on them? No, there weren't. Uh, I think we were too early to actually see any nests with the birds on them. And I don't know if any were actually built, although the instructors said uh, in subsequent workshops, uh, their second workshop uh, on a given year would uh, often have some nests that we could see. I didn't see any at uh, this at this time uh, at that workshop. This was the first workshop of series of three that they have in the springtime. There's a question about uh, hummingbirds. Are they holding their own? Are they on decline? Do you, you know what their status is? Well, when I looked on the uh, Cornell website, uh, their status was still uh, in the safe area. Um, I forget what the, the number was uh, on the website, but they are certainly not endangered or, or anything. Uh, some of them have declined, like I, I mentioned on the uh, on the Harlequins, um, but hummingbird numbers may have gone down on some of the species, but quite frankly, I'm, I'm not up to speed on um, what their stat, you know, how much they've gone down. But uh, I know some hummingbirds are increasing their range, like the Annas are coming up here. Uh, so I'm not sure that um, on the three that were up there in this show, if they were still decreasing, or I'm, I'm certain they were not in any dangerous trouble. So basically, I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> Did you observe uh, any mating flights or? Um... 
Actually, I saw a, a couple of times when uh, birds went up together, kind of um, right together. So I assume that was a, a um, kind of a confrontation type flight. Um, There's a lot of flaring of the gorgets and everything. And I guess when they weren't, um, you know, right, you know, going around up in the air, I guess it was, could be putting on a show for uh, the females, but um, there were once or twice we saw a dive, but um, I don't know, we, I didn't get any pictures of any of that kind of action, but there was some of the dives that were going on that we saw, um, but not too often. Of course, most of our time was uh, at those flash studios and the rest of the time we're kind of walking around and catch as catch can. Judy, did you want to take over at this point? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, there is a question here. What was the very best hint you got from the workshop about photographing hummingbirds? Wow, the best hint about photographing hummingbirds. I guess like any bird photographer is patience. <laughs> right. We had to, um, each of those sessions, each day we had three sessions and like, you know, we were saying there are three to 4,000 pictures that we took. So um, you had to learn how to hit the delete button, which I had a hard time doing because they were all such gorgeous pictures. But um, so patience, uh, being able to hit the delete button were one of the <laughs> things I found out. Um, but that flash setting that I was talking about, you reduce the power of the flash, shortens the duration, so you can capture uh, a lot of the action during a flash. Uh, if you actually lessen the amount of flash that goes out there, it just makes the, the duration of that of the light a lot quicker, sometimes um, a 10,000th of a second or less. Uh, so that was an interesting piece of information I didn't really understand before the, the workshop. Um, and using the long F stop, like I was telling uh, about earlier. But I don't know, that doesn't really answer a question, I guess, but those are some of the things I, I learned. <laughs> well, how did it feel to be in a studio situation rather than shooting out in the wild? Because I know you always are shooting birds just in a natural setting and this seemed like you know, when you have all the flash and the lights up and put the flowers out for them, how did that feel? Well, it's different. I mean, you're, you're like a studio photographer, I guess. <laughs> so right. that's, not usual, that's not usual in my forte. But when we got back, uh, Vic is very enterprising. I don't know if Vic is with us uh, tonight or not, but uh, we set up some uh, stations at his house. Uh, he has a kind of a rural setting and um, had a, um, a water feature that uh, the hummingbirds would, uh, the water was flowing down, the hummingbirds would be on it. And we set up some flash units uh, with hummingbirds in that area, uh, both with nectar and with this water feature. And we played around. It was, it was kind of interesting and fun. But um, it's, you know, it's, it's not what I would do uh, ordinarily. I'll put it that way. Okay. okay. And I think that's all the questions that I see here. Now, there is another one about, about the um, accommodations, Jim. Oh, right. Okay. Well, yes. Kathy Patterson would like to know what were the accommodations like at Bull River Guest Ranch? Well, I don't know if you saw some of the, uh, some of the cabins were like those log cabins. Um, they were uh, various sizes, but they were mostly set up um, for having um, a couple of people in them. We, uh, Vic and I each had our own bed and um, it was heated inside. And on the porch we had um, our own nectar feeders, even though we didn't have the flash setups on our porch. Um, so there were 12, uh, 12 students there um, and some bought, brought their spouses. Uh, they had uh, their own arrangements, uh, but there were cabins, uh, I think in all cases, they were just uh, paired up. So 
Um, it was quite comfortable. Uh, we had a, a larger cabin where f food was provided. Uh, so um, breakfast and dinner were pro provided for us. Oh, we also had lunch uh, and two different sessions so we could still keep shooting uh, alternately there. So it, it's, uh, it's a nice deal. They're scheduling a workshop for this year. I don't know quite how that's going to happen with uh, um, the pandemic situation. I don't know if, about getting over the Canadian border at the moment. Um, they potentially could, you know, if if there were family units that were going, um, it might work. I don't know. The, if you go online and look at um, www.gerlockphoto.com, um, they'll have a thing where you, it talks about the workshops coming up and it's scheduled for this May again. So, um, well, did each cabin have its own bathroom or were there bath houses? I think we had our own bathroom. Okay. Uh, I could be corrected. That's a long time ago, trying to remember back that far. <laughs> okay. uh, but there, there's also a website for the, the ranch uh, the, um, that we went to on um, the Gerlach uh, website. And so you can... Uh, people can go up there, there are weddings that they have, there are all kinds of folks that go up to uh, the guest ranch. So um, they'll have all that information at the get, guest ranch website. Very good. Very good. Thank you.